of the superfoods and longevity world. America's top CEOs, global ambassadors, Hollywood celebrities, busy professionals all look to David Wolf for expert advice in health, beauty, herbalism, nutrition, and chocolate. With over 16 years of dedicated experience and understanding of the inner workings of the human body, David is a true living master of what it means to talk the talk and walk the walk. David is the author of several books, including Eating for Beauty, the Sun Food Diet Success System, Naked Chocolate, Amazing Grace, and Superfoods, the Food and Medicine of the Future. He was featured in the films Food Matters and a personal favorite of mine, Hungry for Change. Uh, David, we have a lot of questions to cover. I'm not sure how many we'll get to within 30 minutes, but it should be enough to get the audience interested in their health and your research. And if it isn't, well, then you blew it. <laughs> All right, that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen a few of your lectures. It's obvious you know what you're talking about, but I am curious. What is your educational background? Great. Um, I have a degree in law, um, a Juris Doctor in law. I have a, a degree in mechanical engineering, a degree in political science, which is really was a degree in philosophy, mostly Greek philosophy. Um, I have a master's in nutrition, and you know, other than the accoutrement that goes along with, like, you know, secondary kind of studies, you know, going through this course and that course and yoga teacher trainings and stuff like that. Those are my main degrees. How long have you been interested in health? Well, I think it started when I first came to California and we first started planting fruit trees, which was in the 70s, in the late 70s, and really had a great time at my uncle's ranch planting over 200 fruit trees during the summers of 78, 79, 1980, and then we eventually moved to California. So I think it was kind of brought into that Southern California health consciousness that way. Each person has their own definition of what happiness is. You know, if you're David Wolf, it's being a health nut. If you live in Alberta, happiness is smoking two packs of cigarettes, drinking a two-six of rye, and eating a cheese donair. And then there's me. You know, I suffer with gout. But there I was two weeks ago in Horseshoe Bay eating oysters Rockefeller. <laughs> Probably the worst thing for gout, right? Um, <laughs> so we know certain things are bad for us, but we trade in our health for entertainment for other forms of happiness. So there has to be a balance. What is that balance? Well, the, the balance is you've got to push yourself out of your comfort zone, but you've got to stay out of the shock zone. And, and that's how life's got to move forward. So if you get too complacent, you kind of get stuck. If you go too berserk and just go over the, over the limits, then you can get yourself wildly out of balance. And so when it comes to health, I like to follow that. And just for myself, I like to get out of my comfort zone, but not into the shock zone. So recently, for example, for me, and I've been a raw foodist for 20 years, you know, done everything. I have a very good friend of mine who's, you know, basically doesn't eat or, you know, doesn't really consume food, basically a liquidarian. And, um, and you know, so I did five days, you know, based on his training of no food and water recently, which was, you know, kind of pushing me out of my comfort zone. But wasn't actually that difficult. I was like, damn, this isn't that hard. And so, you know, that's something he does all the time. So that's kind of an example of what, you know, how I, I'm pushing it at the state that I'm in right now. But your average person would think the raw food is diet. That's pretty extreme. I did it for two months. And because it was so hard, I completely reverted to the old diet <laughs> that I used to have. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, one of the things about raw food is, uh, and just about diets in general, is I'm not really into diets. I'm into, you know, health disciplines, things that are healthy mm -hmm. for you. And you have to kind of find out what that is. And I think we all have an internal barometer that tells us what that is. And as we evolve a little bit, meaning we expand what we're eating, what we're doing, our health regime, for example, our fitness program, as we expand it, then we go, oh, wait, you know, I can actually move into this and I can move into that. And we grow a little bit. And that's really what I'm into is just developing those disciplines that allows us to grow. Now, what are the five most important foods to include in one's diet? Well, one, number one is green vegetables, green leaves, and salad. So I'd say that's, that's the most undernourished food in the Western world is just we've got to eat more greens, more parsley, more lettuce, more kale. That's number one. Number two, I really recommend a controlled, cultured, live probiotic food, which would be like anything from raw sauerkraut and raw kimchi to coconut keepers. I was just having the most amazing coconut keeper yesterday 
that they're making over in, in Maui. That's it was keeper. unbelievable. Yeah, it's like a keeper. Basically, you take the coconut water and you ferment it with friendly bacteria. So basically, the second thing that I'm saying here is about friendly bacteria, getting the live friendly bacteria in your body because we're symbiotic. You know, we live symbiotically with friendly bacteria, and they help us. They help our immune system. They help us to stay healthy, stay young. They keep our digestive system healthy and free of inflammation. So that's that. I'd, so the third one, actually, on the subject of inflammation would be to take in things that are very anti-inflammatory, especially as we age. And one of the best ones is turmeric. Mm. Um, I just had some turmeric in my smoothie this morning. It's very earthy, very amazing golden color. And that gold yellow color is usually associated with the anti-inflammation effects of colors or clues. And that's kind of the indication of what that color does. And then the next one beyond that is You've got to have some kind of a, a plan for getting your, you know, your energy up without stimulants, sugar, or calories. And I really like fresh vegetable juices for that reason. You could do like a celery, cucumber, lemon juice, get tons of energy out of it, and there's no, there's no, there's no calories, there's no stimulants, there's no sugar. And that's a really cool thing to tune in on is a whole other source of energy, and, and raw food's part of that. So fresh vegetable juices are in there. And then the last one would be, Oh, it's some kind of an herbal regime that makes sense to you. And when I say that, I mean most of us take herbs when we're sick or we never even take them at all. I get on the herbs like reishi mushroom, herbs like chaga mushroom, herbs like shizandra, herbs like um, ginseng, herbs like rhodiola regularly as part of what you do, as part of your diet. That's a very strong recommendation that I'd have to make in the world today. And let me give you an example. Last night I found an email from an old friend of mine. I hadn't seen her in ages, and her, mom, her father just died of cancer and it was just like sudden boom 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 he's gone that's it and that's happening to everybody who makes you know who survives heart attacks or survives strokes or dementia they're getting taken off by cancer really quick and, and what's going on there is it's immunological we got to have some kind of immunological defense and that's what these herbs can do for us is build that immunological defense you know you mentioned kale and green vegetables but people are concerned about gmos you know and then organic produce is so expensive. How do we deal with that? Yeah, how do we deal with that? Number one thing to do is you got to get into growing your own food. You, you know, that's really, it's like you got to build that bridge. You know, wherever you are now, let's say point A, you got to get to Z. And you got to build that bridge to get to a point where you can grow your own food. In the old days, back in the 70s, Ann Wigmore and Victoria Skolvinska taught people how to do sprouts and a whole sprout garden in their house in the wintertime, which I'm into and I think that's a great idea. Um, if you have a yard, get out there, start planting kale, start popping tomatoes in, start putting cabbage in, you know, get, get a lot of your food under your own control. There's a lot of anxiety about our future. A lot of anxiety just goes away because, first of all, gardening is very anti-anxiety. Second of all, you've got food security. Is eating the GMO stuff better than not eating it? No, no, you're better off not eating. Really? The whole, yeah, the whole thing's a total experiment. We don't have any idea what the effects of GMOs are in the long or short term on humans. Um, we know in animals there's been some pretty scary studies that have been done. There are hundreds, if not even over a thousand scientists around the world now that have gotten together to oppose GMOs based on the research. And that numbers, you know, those numbers are going to grow. The, the thing about GMOs that we need to ask ourselves is why such a rush? Why do we need to rush into this so much? Don't we need more research, more studies, more time? Let's be scientific and go slow. What's all this rushing about? And the rushing, to me, is it's about, it's about a monopoly. It's about global food monopolies. And that's why I'm into farming, because I'm against global food monopolies. I want to grow my own food, and, and I'm out of that whole picture, of that whole scene of that kind of insanity and world control. Is organic really that much more expensive than inorganic or GMO? Because as I understand, you get a higher nutritional content with the organic stuff, and you feel fuller, right? Well, I think it's less expensive, ultimately, because you're going to either pay now or pay later, and it's a lot more when you pay later. But you've got Obamacare now. You're, everybody gets oh, free right. health care. Everybody's getting free health care. The thing is, is no, I don't want that health care. I don't want... The, it's not, it's not health care. Disease care. It's about people who don't take responsibility for themselves and then require all this medicine and all this surgery and all the cut, burn, poison theory which we're not into. We're into alternative methods of health. So if it was really health care, it would be about health, but it's really about disease care and basically taking people on, onto the dole who can't take care of themselves, who don't have any self-responsibility. So what we're into is furthering self-responsibility and self-care and promoting that angle on how we're going to deal with you know, the, our 
growing health crisis or actually disease crisis? Uh, I'm 34, almost entering into mid-age, I guess. Uh, do nutritional needs change as we age? Great question. The answer is yes. Absolutely. There, it's very different when you're young. When you're young, when you're, like, say, you're 0 to 12 years old or 15 years old, you're, you're drawing in a huge amount of substance from the environment. A huge amount of, of food is required as compared to, say, when you're 40 and you're already completely constructed. You don't need much at that point. You're 40 years old. You know, you're already constructed. Everything's good. So the answer is yes. As you grow older, you need less food. If you exercise more, you're able to get away with more food, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you need more food. In fact, I think it's better to eat less in general. Um, if you're pregnant, you're going to need some different and unique ingredients. You know, you're know, you going to need the long-chain omega-3 fatty acids and the vitamin B9 and vitamin B12. And you're going to need the coconut oil, the saturated fats for that baby to grow. You're going to need you know, the things that seal in your joints really nicely. You're going to need more sulfur in your diet, more of the, you know, the stuff that has bite stuff like um, cruciferous vegetables and you know, has a little bit of a bite to it. That's the cysteine amino acid that helps with um, developing that baby. There's sulfur fanes that help with genetically protect that baby. That's what, you know, cruciferous vegetables, when a woman's pregnant, very valuable, you know, unless she has some, something going on with her thyroid and can't take in fresh cruciferous vegetables, and then they'd have to be cooked or something because of the glycogens. But there's some interesting research now indicating that cruciferous vegetables are some of the most important foods you can eat at any stage, in any situation, especially pregnant. I think another thing that concerns women is calcium. And, you know, up here in Canada anyway, we can only get pasteurized milk. But in Vietnam, they don't have dairy products. I was watching a show, they eat the bones of the snake. Like, they eat everything to get that calcium. Uh, how important is it, and where are some alternatives to get it other than dairy? Okay, well, vegetables are a great source of calcium. They always have been. That's where the cow gets it. The cow gets it from the grass. So the grass is loaded in calcium. Obviously, we're not like a ruminant animal, but we but, can get that from the vegetables that we eat or the vegetable juices. Mm -hmm. But let me ask, is milk actually a great source of calcium? Is that, if it weren't pasteurized, is that where we should get it from? Not necessarily, no. And it's, too, it's too high in calcium and too low in magnesium and silica, which are very important cofactors, and it also doesn't have enough phosphorus in it to knit that bone together. So... Let's just break it down. One of the things we found out about bone density is the most important factor is actually a hormone, and that hormone is progesterone for a woman. Anyway, for a man, it's testosterone. Once your progesterone starts going down um, after menopause, for example, bone density issues arise. So we've got to keep that progesterone up in a woman and testosterone in a man up in order to keep that bone mineralization happening. Vitamin D3 is probably second in importance. You know, so we're not even into nutrition and minerals yet. It's just sunlight and hormones first. The next thing is going to be the need for the right kind of minerals. And calcium is one mineral, but it's not the main one for bone density. So people are like, what do you mean? Our bone bones are made out of calcium. We need calcium. That's a very superficial theory and has never been proven to be true. It, actually, all herbal systems that preceded us always believed that the best thing to build bone density is silica, magnesium, phosphorus, boron, um, what's that great, there's a great um, strontium, non-radioactive strontium. That's a great alkaline mineral that builds bone. But calcium is actually a poor bone builder, strangely enough. And that has to do with the concept of biological transmutations, the work of Lewis Cavran, and the work of many hundreds of research scientists over the years who didn't buy into Lavoisier's law that calcium is always calcium is always calcium. There's the whole idea out there that actually silica and magnesium are converted into bone, they're converted into calcium at the osteoblast site where the bone's being formed. What's wrong with medicine these days? I mean, we all know there's a huge pharmaceutical industry behind it all, but where did it all go wrong? I, I think it's too materialistic. It, it basically identifies a human body as a machine. We're not a machine. We're not a car. You can't take a part out and replace it. We're an integrated, holistic, biological unit, and we're multidimensional. So you can't just, oh, this part's bad, let's just get rid of it. Oh, that part's you know, bad, let's just replace it. It's that kind of thinking that leads to the magic pill concept, that leads to the surgery, the cut, burn, poison theory, the lack of responsibility. We need to get more into like taking responsibility, really having strategies set up for ourselves, fitness strategies, nutrition strategies, and then working with them and then building on it and then developing ourselves. It's a, that's what self-responsibility is about. It's developing 
our skills as a, as a healthy person, which is, you know, it starts in, in the beginning with just, okay, let me take vitamins, and then it gradually works its way into your fitness regime or your herbal regime or your raw foods or juices or whatever. I got an email from uh, a guy in China, and uh, he's asking, will Wolf's approach to food and nutrition work in a colder climate where fewer foods, and especially fruits, can be grown? Great question. Well, what I, I live half the year in Canada, actually, in Ontario. And uh, I, I love Ontario. I'm in central Ontario, which is definitely not warm. It's about minus 35 there in the winter for at least a week yeah. each winter. And, uh, and I love it like that. Now, in that kind of environment, you have to be a little bit more like a squirrel. You have to prepare more for the winter. Now, we live in the woods, way in the bush. So, you know, we have, I can't just go to a store. What I've got is what i got. So I've got the whole bucket of seaweed. I've got all kinds of amazing fruits that I've dried from the summer. I've got all kinds of herbs that I picked from the summer. I've got spring water so I can make all my teas. Um, so I do, do do hot tea or warm tea in the winter. Um, I, don't, I don't do, you know, other things like soups and things like that, but I think soups are great if you live in a cold climate. Um, and, I, and I basically blend a lot of my meals in the winter, so I take a lot of that stuff and I blend it into my teas. Like, I'll take all my superfoods, I'll take things that I dried in the, in the summer, for example. I, you know, we do a lot of grapes, so I have a lot of raisins that get me through the winter. And my overall strategy works. After, you know, through the whole winter, you can get by on what's there. And there are fresh foods available, even in the coldest climates, um, in the bush. For example, one of my favorite foods is called rock tripe, which grows on rocks, the lichen. And I've learned about it from studying Arctic explorers, and it's all over my place. It's, all, it's everywhere, all over the property. And uh, we just eat a little bit of that every now and then. It's 80 minerals, super nutritious, and it tastes best and is freshest in February, in the middle of the winter. You're from Jersey, though, right? Originally from New Jersey, that's right. Originally from Tom's River, New Jersey, Seaside Heights, um, the home of the show, The Jersey Shore, if you've ever seen that. Hopefully you haven't. <laughs> I have not. I have not. <laughs> but are you an expat, or you're Canadian now? Um, no, I'm, I'm a Canarian. Um, <laughs> You're like uh, the Michael J. Fox. Or <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of half, half and half. If I don't eat meat or dairy, how can I maintain a healthy weight? Eating whole grains, veggies, uh, juicing, that's great. But I noticed this too. The weight, is, you know, for women, I was going out with a girl last year. We went on that raw food diet together. And she went from 115 to 105 in less than a month. And that's what stopped her from continuing. Just can't keep the weight up. Okay, great question. One, one thing is, is it's metabolism related. Some people actually have to eat cooked food, especially cooked starchy food, in order to keep that weight on. And some people can, like, I have a slower metabolism. I don't need to eat very much at all. And my, you know, I just stay at the same weight. I mean, it's unbelievably unique to see how different we all are, because I get to see that every day. It's really amazing. It's like, not fair, you know, David. I, <laughs> I know, it's not fair. It's like I have assistants. That well, it, it, it's I, it kind of bothers me. I, I have assistants, get girls who, who are like, you know, they might weigh I don't know fifty kilos or less, forty five kilos or whatever. I'm not exactly sure. They're real tiny. They can eat more than me in a day, and they don't gain it, gain any weight. And I eat that same amount that they have, and I gain weight. So it just it just shows you how our metabolisms are different. And so you got to find the right diet for your metabolism. Raw food is a very cool thing to have for just being healthy, especially in the summer. It has a lot to do with energy. But you also have to maintain your common sense. Like, you have to kind of see, okay, my, where's my energy at? Where, you know, where's my weight at? How am I looking? Is this really cleansing me out? You know, you need to kind of keep a sense um, right on your radar of, like, where you are in this overall diet picture and where your metabolism is because you're, you're your own best guru. You're, on your best, you're, you're your own best nutritionist and doctor. So you've got to kind of look at, you know, all those factors and go, okay, you know what? Need to have a little bit of this, need to have a little bit of that to make it all make sense for me. So not each person has, there's not one diet for every single person on earth. It doesn't work that way. It, you know, it, in fact, this, this is my feeling, Russell, it's exactly the opposite. There's a diet for every single person on earth. We're so unique and individual that there's no diet that could be the same for any two people on earth. So you've seen this food pyramid. What do you think of that? You know, put out by Health Canada. It, oh yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, it's the same kind of, bottom line that we've always gotten, like, you know, you have to eat tons of meat, tons of dairy, you know, a little bit of vegetables, tons of carbohydrates, 
And it's like, look, first of all, eating all that food, that's a lot of food. Second of all, you don't need to be eating that high up on the food chain all the time. So people are, people tend to take, like, it's either got to be all meat and dairy or none. And actually, you need to find that, that balance. What I like to do with our education programs is get people to understand how to actually be healthy and balanced eating vegetarian food to keep their blood sugar stable most of the time. doesn't mean all the time, but most of the time. Because it's healthier to eat lower on the food chain because all the toxicity is in our environment. You know, the stuff that's being spewed out of cars, chemicals in our environment, nuclear stuff. Every animal is a sponge for that. And every animal is eating tens of thousands of, of leaves, for example, or plant material or blades of grass. So they're concentrating that environment into themselves. And that's why we've got to be careful in the age we live in now about eating high on the food chain. Are humans on the top of the food chain? We're, we're, I think we're on the top of every chain on this planet. Um, we like to do. We like to control everything. So um, don't be a cannibal. Been, we're we're not good eating. Yeah, we're, we're pro- well. I might be. I, I've been a vegetarian for twenty years, so I, yeah. I don't know. But cannibals might like me. But anyway, I'm in the. Um, this is kind of interesting. I'm in Africa. I finally made it to South Africa. We're in one of those game parks right next to Kruger Park, and there was a lion right next to the vehicle we're in, and. And you realize right there, you're like, whoa, we are, we are capable of being eaten by a lion. I never really understood how big they actually are. They are huge. They're as big as a car. You're a raw foodist, so you're only eating raw all the time? You're saying you do right. eat some cooked, though. I, I, no, I, eat some, I drink some tea, hot tea or yeah. warm tea, but I don't eat like bread or meat or cheese or starchy food or anything like that. I've been a raw foodist for about 20 years. For the average person, again, you, like you said, there's a diet for every single person, unfortunately. But what would you say is a good rule of thumb, the percentage of raw versus cooked? And, and should we be vegan? Good. Okay, good. I think, I think a lot of people need to be vegan for a while to learn how to balance their blood sugar without animal products. I think that's a really good skill to have, and it also helps you to eat less and be more in balance with yourself and learn about yourself. So the answer is a qualified yes on that one. Um, what's a good rule of thumb for raw food? In the summer, should definitely be mostly raw food. You can get to 80% raw food in the summer really easily. You know, just that's kind of like summertime living. In the winter, it's a little harder because you need something that's a little bit more hearty or warmer soup, things that have a little bit more calories in them. So maybe 50% raw in the winter in Vancouver. Now, if you're in other places, you know, it might be a little bit different. But Vancouver, you know, you've got to deal with that damp wetness through the winter and the cold wet. And so you're going to need something to counterbalance that. Suggestions for those people while traveling. You're in all sorts of different countries, trains, hotels, uh, whether you're camping or, you know, how do you prepare for traveling? Oh, great. Well, it's so easy now. I mean, in the old days, I used to have to carry a book around with me that had every health food store in it. Now I can just Google it on my phone, you know, where the health food stores are, or farmer's market. Mm-hmm. I come prepared. I always travel with something. I have a, like a little doctor's bag. My, my dad's a doctor. You know, I grew up in a doctor's household. My, you know, my mom's a doctor as well. And I always have my doctor's bag with me, which is, you know, I picked up from my dad, which has all my little goodies in there. I might have, you know, my little goji berries in there. I might have little raw cacao beans or trail mix in there or something, you know, some little seaweed thing. And that kind of keeps me tied over so I can make it through the airports and, to, you know, to the distant destinations that I'm going to. What foods would you recommend for a survival garden? Ooh, great question. One thing I like, and it's basically a different concept in gardening, and we call it permaculture. And that's, you know, that's what my yard is here, both in Hawaii and I've got my farm in Canada. And what we do is we basically do survival kind of planting where you don't have to take care of it. So the best kind of thing is, like, for example, in Ontario, I've got hundreds of berries because I don't have to take care of them. They just produce food for me every single year, and I don't have to do anything about it. That's the best type of thing. If you're into planting perennials, you're better off. Annuals is a lot of work because it's like every year you've got to sprout them, then you've got to get them in the greenhouse, then you've got to get them into the ground. It's a whole ordeal. So I like stuff that's self-seeding perennials first. And some of those categories that I've included would be berries. I like the um, repeating leaf crops. For example, parsley can come back year after year after year. Kales can go back, come back year after year after year in certain climates. Probably in Vancouver they come back every year. I like, what else would I put into there? I, well, I, I'm a big believer in the goji berry. As long as you don't have deer predating in your area, goji berries will do really good. Even where I have deer, like in, in Ontario, we have goji berries going, but right in front of the house where the deer won't come. 
and that's a great annual superfood berry. You know, so some of these things I like to grow are not just foods like lettuce. It's actually, they're actually like superfoods. Another thing that I'm really into and I think is very good for a survival garden is the pumpkins and squashes and um, melons. And it, not so much for the flesh of those, but for the seeds. The seeds are a great source of fat. No animals can get into them. This is something I noticed farming in Ontario. We're in the middle of the woods. Anybody can come in there. It can be any squirrel, bears, anything, deer can come in there. And I found out, you know, if I just grow pumpkins, they won't touch them. If I'm growing a um, pine nut tree, those squirrels will eat every nut on that tree. I won't get any food at all. But they won't touch the pumpkins. They won't touch the melons. And so that was just an interesting discovery. Butter versus margarine, I'm curious about. Oh, uh, yeah, butter for sure. Raw organic butter for sure. I and mean, in fact, raw organic butter is one of the few animal foods that I think is a really cool thing. It's just, it's great for kids, great for growing kids, and it's, it's got a very, especially, let me just name it. You want to look for the butter from the fast-growing grass in the springtime. So the cow eats the fast-growing grass in the springtime. They produce their milk from that, and the butter's made from that particular time in the year. That's the best butter you can get. And oils, we, you know, coconut is... The popularity of the coconut has gone through the roof, and uh, hopefully that doesn't mean that we're going to lose all the coconuts here on Earth because everybody's into the coconut water these days. There are so many coconuts that go to waste just like here in Hawaii. I'm in Hawaii right now. It's, yeah. So I don't think that's going to be a problem. There's so many out there. Um, but I will say this about coconut oil. The reason why it's so popular is because it works, and women love it, in particular women. And it's a great lotion. It's so simple, and it, there's no additive, so it's nice. Olive oil, I'm a big fan of olive oil. Research study came out summer of 2012, done in Spain. 10,000 people studied over 15 years. Longest lived people in the study, the people who are still alive after 15 years, all olive oil consumers. The more olive oil you consume, especially of high quality, only get the high quality stuff. The poor quality stuff is not worth eating. Um, but the high quality olive oil is it. It's an amazing crop. It's an amazing food. It's an amazing longevity substance. And then I'm into the omega-3s, both the long chain omega-3, which would be Algae oil, pearl oil, fish oil, one of those three, depending on which, you know, if you're a vegetarian, you do the algae oil. If you're, you know, it doesn't matter to you, you can do the krill or the fish oil. Those long-chain omega-3s are important. And then the ALA omega-3s from hemp seed oil, excellent. So that's kind of the whole gamut from the saturated to the omega-3. I didn't hear canola oil in there. I've heard that's really good. Yeah, that's, <laughs> canola oil is not, not one of them. Rapeseed oil is actually yeah. the name of it. And, uh. It's, it's basically, it's estrogenic, it's, it's not good, and, it, and it's also rancid usually as well. Overall, you've got to be very careful about quality of oil. Pretty much every health food store has everything that we just went over. It has really good quality coconut oil, really good quality olive oil. It's got the algae, krill, or fish oil that you want. And so then, you know, there you got, and the hemp oil. So there you got all of that covered. But every health food store has pretty much got that covered at this point. What's the difference between a nutritionist and a dietitian? Or are they the same? Well, it's basically the same. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a term of art. A dietitian is a member of, like in America, would be a member of the American Dietetics Association to be called a dietitian. So you have to actually have to pass their, their qualifications in order to be a dietitian. Well, the American Dietetics Association's, you know, whatever their requirements are, which is, I've gone, you know, I've done three, gone through all that stuff that they require. And it's basically like, you know, what is, you know, what is vitamin B3? What is vitamin B2? How, what does vitamin B6 do? It's really not where we are in our understanding of nutrition. It's kind of antiquated. So I'm not really interested in pursuing that kind of stuff. I'm more interested in pursuing, you know, where we are now, which is, you know, I'm, I'm feeling like, hey, we've done the mineral supplements. We've done the vitamin supplements. We need to get that more from food. How do we get that from food more? And that's brought in this whole superfood revolution that's kind of more where our understanding is at this point. What's going to win? The GMO and Hostess, Nestle, Coca-Cola, are they going to win? Or are like-minded people like you and I, are we going to win? We're going to win eventually because what they're doing is unsustainable. It's, it's eventually going to collapse. And organic farming, which means traditional farming, the way we've always farmed on the planet, is going to last because it's what works and it's what's sustainable. So it might be a rough ride, but we will eventually win. Are there any uh, conferences that you're doing that uh, you can tell the audience about? Ooh, what's coming up? You know, we've got an amazing conference coming up October 2nd in Toronto, actually. And we're going to have a great event there in Toronto. And uh, all my details, I'd like if you want to find out what's going on, 
with me. You can find that all out at davidwolf.com, W-O-L-S-E.com, and, and all my events are there. Just click events, and you can find out where we're going to be in Toronto. We're also going to be in Montreal um, on October 12th and 13th, just right after that. So October 2nd, Toronto, October 12th, 13th in Montreal. Your DVD, um, or the DVD that you're in, Hungry for Change, it's a great show to initiate people into this food revolution, as you're saying. Is that, is that still on Netflix? Uh, do you know? It is, yes. A Hungry for Change is actually not my project. It's my friends James and Laurentine, and uh, they're a wonderful couple. They're, they're just having a baby right now. I need to contact them like today. It could be happening. And uh, they've done a great job, both Food Matters and then Hungry for Change. And somehow that I got, you know, because I'm friends with them and I'm in those films, somehow it's, you know, the people are like, hey, that's your movie. And I have I had some hand in it. Like, you know, the name Food Matters is actually a name that I came up with. Um, but that's as far as it goes. You know, other than that, it's really their genius that's brought those films out and got them onto airplanes around the world and put it on Netflix. And they've done an awesome job. So they have to be congratulate, congratulated. I want to take the credit away from them. They're amazing. David Wolf, it's been an honor. Thank you so much for being on the program. Thank you, Russell Scott. Have the best day ever. Thanks to everybody listening.